So as we continue to talk about how to solve the problems around the officiating crisis, we keep talking about the need to collaborate and get on the same page with regard to the issue. This panel brings in members of organizations who are doing work in terms of ethical conduct of various stakeholders in the sport, public affairs, legislation, and coaches training and education. We are excited to bring some new faces and organizations with us today. Our panelists are seated next to me, Jack Furlong, the founder and president of the OSIP Foundation. And for those of you who are wondering, like I was, OSIP stands for Outstanding Sportsmanship is Paramount, which I think we can all agree with. Next to him, we have Bill Topp, who you met yesterday. He's back to talk to us today. He is the Chief Operating Officer of the National Association of Sports Officials. Seated next to him is Roger Harvey, Principal of Bose Public Affairs Group. And at the end, last but not least, we have Ryan Virtue, the Regional Partnership Manager for the Positive Coaching Alliance. Let's give our panel a round of applause. And let's roll. So Jack, OSIP believes that everyone plays a role in good sportsmanship. How can organizations get the buy-in of parents, coaches, and media in terms of making the sports atmosphere positive? So one of the biggest things that we face, I learned this from um, Frank Vitorito of the National Sportsmanship uh, Foundation in St. Louis, is that the people who need to hear your message the most are the people who are not going to listen to you. It's, it's, it's an uphill battle. And, and the best way to, to do that is to kind of fight the opposite battle, which is to empower your allies, is to give the people who already support you everything that they need to continue to fight the good fight. Um, so we try and highlight the good sportsmanship of, of, of the players who, uh, who already do this naturally, you know, we, whether it's a luncheon or a certificate or whatever, we're, we're gonna try and go in and make sure that we plant that seed and positively reinforce that behavior. You know, we want to praise the parents who, uh, who, who are on our side with that. Um, you know, it's also important to select the right people for the job when it comes to some of these uh, coaches and administrators and whatnot. You know, I know we talked about the issue with turnover, the issue with administration and whatnot, and, and, and the battle that we fight with that. Um, and one of the things that I see a lot is that the, the, the desire to win gets put ahead of the, um, you know, the importance of, of the relationship and the building of our student athletes. You know, um, I'm in my 16th year of umpiring baseball in New Jersey, and I have to still say to high school coaches, you know, I know that you and I are wearing different uniforms, but we're on the same team here. You know, you and I have a responsibility to the student athletes here to make sure that they have the best possible experience that they can to, to, to grow and whatnot. So, you know, if you interact with me, let's let's do it in the right way. Let's you know treat me with respect because I want to treat you with respect as well. Um, you know, because in my in my opinion and experience, winning is a byproduct of chemistry and sportsmanship. If you if you put those things together, the scoreboard kind of takes care of itself. Um, in terms of the media, it's it's probably one of the hardest things because the media, as said, the media kind of has carte blanche to control the narrative. You know, um, they get to they they're the ones who get to uh, kind of determine what we what we believe to a certain degree. It's it, it's it's a very unfortunate thing, you know, because we don't we don't always have the the conscious ability to take a step back and you know question these things and, and to kind of. Uh, tap into that, that that breakthrough learning that we had when we were when we were you know in first grade when, you know, when, when we would believe anything that that, that our teachers told us. Um, but 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 you know one of the, one of the best sites that I found when it comes to the media uh, is is an objective site called Close Call Sports. If you're not familiar with Close Call Sports, uh, these cats uh, their motto is to objectively track and analyze close and controversial calls in sport with great regard for rules and the spirit of the game. Their big thing is called the Umpire Ejection Fantasy League. So they they, they, they track Major League Baseball umpires and, and whatnot, and they go through all of these calls that that you know usually end up with some sort of discipline, and, and they will objectively say the call was correct, the call was incorrect, and whatnot, and and they try and put the real news out there, and it's it's it's, it's fascinating to see, you know, and it's fascinating to see the discussion that that, that comes from that. So it's. It's a, it, it, it can be a tough sell when it comes to that, but if you extend the olive branch, you know, you'll, be, you'll be very surprised, I think, at, 
at what occurs. Thank you. For Roger, from a public affairs standpoint, what do you think that organizations can do to create awareness of the officiating shortage to the general public and to let everyone know how they can be a part of the solution? So uh, first of all, I just want to let you know that I'm coming at this from a little bit different perspective than, than some of these other panelists. I spent um, 18 years in television news, um, traveling around the world. So basically whenever you turn your TV on, you see the crazy person in some hot spot. That was me for 18 years. So uh, my career was bookended by Hurricane Hugo and Katrina was the last thing I covered, Iraq, Afghanistan, 9-11, Oklahoma City, you name it. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is because what I do as it relates to, to you all, and specifically schools, is that um, I'm much like the fire extinguisher that's behind the, the glass. You know, you walk by it, nobody ever thinks twice about it, and then all of a sudden, um, when you need it, you break the glass. So I, I, mean, I get involved with things when things start going south, um, and that's what I do with my firm now, um, crisis communications reputation management. And one of the things, the reason why I wanted to give you that background is one of the things that I try to instill in clients all the time is that you have to be out there telling your story. Because if you're not telling your story, one of two things is going to be happening and neither one of them are good, right? Either no one is telling your story or worse yet, someone else is trying to tell your story and they're not accurate about it. And so the, it's a lot of times where I, I deal with clients and it's like, oh, if we just don't say anything, you know, the ostrich just, just act like nothing's happening, don't address that, that issue in the corner of the room, it'll all go away. Well, that's, that's, not, the way it, that's not the way it is. And you know, one of the things is, as, a, um, as a father that, um, that has kids that were fortunately much better than their dad in sports and did very well competitively, um, I've seen that side of the equation too. And I do think, I do think it's a, it's something that I believe in the last, I would say, 10 years has really escalated because you've got more and more, you've got a couple of things I've seen. These are just, you know, I've lived in seven states working in the news business and seen quite a bit. Um, you've got a combination of parents that never played sports or they didn't do very well in sports. And so they're living vicariously through their kids, right? Which is, as a coach, that's probably one of the worst things you want to be dealing with. And then you have the others that are investing, you know, two grand a month, whatever, you know, with all this coaching and training and, and Johnny or Sally, you know, not playing as much as they'd like to. So, you know, these coaches um, are facing a dynamic of not only they have 15 players on the team, but they've got eight parents <laughs> that are, you know, problems as well. And so the pressure then continues to mount. So then you get to a game setting, right? And so the parent has got a little edge, doesn't feel good about where things are. You know, the, the, the stripes on the court or the field or wherever the, the, the game is being played makes a call and then, you know, the, the pressures continue to mount. And so I, I will, and I know we're gonna probably talk about this a little bit more, I do think I've seen some things in the last six months um, from uh, the National um, Federation and from some states where I do think it's, it's you all are doing a good job of starting to tell that story more. I, I do think there's a lot more work that needs to be done and, and hopefully we'll get into some of that, but I think you're well on, you're well on your way because um, what I'm seeing from you all is that this is something that is, is trending the wrong way and it's likely only going to get worse. And um, you know, I, I don't think it's too far of a, of a leap for you all to really start letting people know that if this doesn't turn around quickly, um, we may have to cancel games, sports, and things like that, and that's when it'll start getting real to people. Next question is for Bill. Could you tell us a little bit about state legislation that provides additional protection for sports officials? How many states currently have it, and what does that legislation generally look like? Well, you, you may have heard yesterday there's assaults going on, sports officiating. Um, I think the whole county heard yesterday <laughs> that there was assaults going on in sports fishing. But NASO has been at the forefront of trying to pass legislation, help states pass legislation for more than 40 years. And it's a very interesting process and procedure. Um, Mel Narrow, the late Mel Narrow, was one of the leading advocates and attorney for sports fishing in this area. And he wrote uh, basically a, a draft of what legislation could look like, which is found on NASO's website at NASO.org to this day. Um, there's never been more activity than in the last couple of years. What we've seen is uh, an ebb and flow with this over time. 
Uh, there's some states that have been very proactive with legislation helping to protect sports officials. Others have done nothing. There's about 22 states, and there's two others that have uh, resolutions of support, but not actual legislation. So there's 24 legislators that have actually taken up the cause in some fashion. It varies, um, and the challenges vary. But there's activity going on in about seven states right now. You know, when I say activity, it could just mean a committee meeting at this point, but something is happening. And that's, we've never seen that before. We've never seen that much activity at once. We've gone years without any activity in this area. So uh, I think it's because of the public relations part of this. I think people are paying attention to the shortage uh, and it's affecting people. And the shortage has led to people realizing the behavior is bad and the behavior is realizing that assaults are occurring because of the behavior. The state <coughs> legislators are finally waking up and saying, we gotta do something. So this is a good thing. It's because of a bad problem, but it's a good thing. Uh, there's challenges with it. One of the biggest, frankly, and this is just, I'm not telling you things you don't already know to deal with this all the time, but it takes a very unfortunate bad event in your state to get the attention it needs to push it over the top very often. Very few state legislators are proactive in this area. It's going to take a high profile assault to get everybody's attention and get moving on. It's sad, but it's true. That's the way it happens. It almost always happens that way. Um, the thing that helps a lot was actually said yesterday, um, finding somebody in the legislature that has a sports officiating background <coughs> is huge. If they can stand up and tell their story, it has more, more credibility within their peers. It's just simple. But that's huge. We've got to get those people on our side. I'll tell a quick funny story, but Wisconsin is a very purple political state. I mean, right down the middle. <laughs> I mean, our elections are crazy close all the time, one way or the other. Well, the one thing we could get the Wisconsin legislature to agree on, legislature to agree on, is to not pass this. <laughs> we had uh, we were testifying and. Uh, on behalf of the bill that got support from a few legislatures in the WIAA and, and the State University Conference, uh, Division Three Conference. Um, and all those things were happening in a good fashion through committees, we had some support, we finally got to testify. And the one thing we could agree on, that they could agree on, was that the, the people that lean towards small government said we don't need more laws. That's a hard thing to overcome. But the people that maybe lean the other way were talking about this possibly being a law that might dis appropriately, disaffectionately, appropriately, uh, despairingly deal with only certain segments of class. So you had both sides saying, well, this could affect only a certain number of people, therefore we don't want to do this. And you had the other side saying, we don't need more laws. We already have assault. We already have felonies. What's the problem? But here's the challenge. And this is the biggest challenge. We have to find a way to overcome this better than what we're doing. We have to convince people that we are a protected class. Every state does this differently. We have you know, first responders that are a protected class. We have states with teachers that are a protected class. We have people that have taxi drivers that are a protected class because of the environments that they work in. We have to help them understand that sports officials are in a protected class because of the environment that we're working in. And when we said to the state legislature in Wisconsin, when it got to the protected class discussion, are state legislators in Wisconsin a protected class? And the answer, of course, is yes. So we gotta do a better job of convincing them. And unfortunately, it's gonna take a big time event in your state, but that, those are the two issues. Either, either we don't need the law because we already have assaults. If you get punched in the face, we already have laws that take care of that. And how do we make sure that we, they understand the athletic endeavor that is the, has the temperature up so high that we deserve to be in a protected class. Thank you, Bill. And for those of you who are here, if you haven't looked at the NASO site at the legislative scorecard, I would highly recommend you do that. There's some really good information about states that have it, what those different legislation um, drafts and such look like. So please take a look at it. And if you're considering going down that path in your state, I'm volunteering NASO, 
feel free to reach out to our friends at NASO and, and they will help you through that process because I've, I'm sure they've gotten a million calls about it over the years, so thank you. Um, for Ryan, how important is it that coaches are the catalyst for change in cleaning up the sport environment? Well, good morning, everybody, and Dana, Dr. Neha, thanks so much for the opportunity to be here and put this organization, put this incredible conference together. Um, coaches can't be the catalyst; they can be a catalyst, right? We've all sat here and talked the last couple of days about um, you know, the importance of leadership and setting people up for success. And I think for anybody that's in any position, whether you're a coach, a parent, an athlete, a uh, official, a leader, anytime you point your finger at somebody else, there's three fingers pointing right back at you. So we always need to look at ourselves first, figure out what we can do. But coaches have a, a massive responsibility, obviously, with the uh, the kids, the families, the game day environment, um, and, and culture. And I think Kennedy said it yesterday, you know, as leaders, we need to set the tone, but our coaches need to help to know how to be a catalyst, right? They've proven to us Bill, shared, Bill and Ken shared some stats yesterday that coaches are the number two problem perceived by our officials, right? So we can't just assume our coaches know how to act when we ask them to act that way, right? They've proven to us that they don't know how to do that. They get caught up in the competitive environment. They get caught up in um, all the emotion of the live game day. And so we need to help them, right? And we talked a lot about it over the last couple of days through our, our different panelists, through the different conversations the offline conversations, how are we setting expectations, right? When we set expectations, let's really look at not just what are we verbally telling them we expect from them, is the sportsmanship piece, is everything that we're talking about, the importance of how we present ourselves, the importance of how we model things for our kids, for our athletes, for our parents, is that in their job description? Or are we just saying, hey, we need you to go out and win some games, right? So really look at, at that side of things. Do they know what our organizational mission is? Do we know what our organizational mission is? I can't tell you how many board of directors rooms or AD conversations I have, and I'll usually start that conversation with the same question first, and that's, hey, before we get into anything, can you, can you tell me what your mission is? Can you tell me what your organizational mission is? The entire purpose of why we're here? And I get blank stares about 95% of the time. They're, they're like, well, I think it's, I'm like, hold on. If your mission statement starts with, well, I think it's problem number one is right here. Because you're really the blind leading the blind, right? If you don't know what your job or responsibility or mission is, how are you going to help lead coaches to be catalysts? How are you going to lead anybody else to be a catalyst? So it really starts internally. And then helping them understand the importance of, listen, at the end of the day, and I don't care how organizations' missions are, at the youth and high school level, the mission is really we need to prepare for kids for life through sports, or the next steps in their lives through sports. That's the mission, right? Simply put, it's all worded different ways, but simply put, our job is to get our kids to the next step in their lives, whether that's the professional world, whether that's going off to college, wherever that may be. And so it's vital that we help coaches understand the importance of modeling the behavior that we want to see from our kids. If we have coaches that are acting a fool on the sidelines, crazy animated towards officials or anybody else, they're giving a green light to their kids to do the same thing, a green light to their parents to do the same thing. If you actually watch, watch, watch game film, you all watch game film, watch when the coach starts to go crazy and how that elevates everybody else in the atmosphere, right? And it's not even verbal, it's the nonverbal, right? Communication that's vital. So we need to help increase some self-awareness. So the second piece is, are we providing education for our coaches that actually aligns with the expectations that we lay out for? We can tell them what we want, but again, they've proven to us that they don't naturally know. And we've also talked over the last couple of days about the declining number of educators who are coaching. So now we're pulling people in from whatever other occupations who don't know our kids. Right? They don't know the expectations of the classroom or scholastic environment. We do a really good job, for the most part, with PD for our teachers. But if, if about 70% of our coaches are now coming from outside of the building, what PD are we providing them? Because they don't understand our kids. So it's the learning side, they don't understand. They're there to coach a sport. They're not necessarily there to coach the kids. There's a drastic difference between those things. Um, and then I think the biggest thing that we need to help them understand is, is how to develop a self-control routine. 
right? A lot of the issues that we see, especially when we get to globe scenarios, um, especially with officials, is they're reacting, right? They're just knee-jerk reacting to something that happened. That's a weakness. Lack of self-control is a weakness, so it has to be something that's developed, right? We have to be able to take that pause moment and act intentionally instead of simply reacting. But again, that's a skill set that, that's a societal issue. That's not a sports issue, but it's something that's revealed a lot through sports, is the lack of self-awareness because of the adverse situations, the speed of the game, the intense desire to want to win, right? The feeling like you have to perform for your kids and for your parents, otherwise you're gonna get you know, lambasted by everybody else, right? So we have to do a good job of educating and helping our coaches understand how to be more self-aware and be able to act appropriately. And then the other big piece that we haven't really talked about a lot is not only how are we setting expectations, but what are we doing to evaluate them on those expectations? I think this is true for the officials too. We've talked about this, right? Self-awareness raising, how we provide more tools and soft skill training and all that side of things. That's important. But when we look at the evaluation, right, for a lot of athletic administrators, when we're evaluating coaches, it's basically based on, did my phone ring a lot complaining about this coach? Because you're not at every practice, you're not at every game, right? So you can't really effectively evaluate. So how do we make sure we're providing self-evaluation opportunities that align with, obviously, the, the job description that we put in front of them? How are we making sure that we're providing evaluation opportunities for our kids on their coach. Their voice matters more than anybody else's, right? And obviously that's age appropriate for a little league or whatever. <laughs> that would be, I'd be actually entertained to see what their evaluation results would say. Uh, not enough ice cream. Um, but anyways, um, but then the parents, especially in the high school environment, should have an opportunity to evaluate their coaches. If we're taking a 360 evaluation, and we really want to know what kind of job our coaches are doing. And the intent of these evaluations is not correctional, right? It's developmental, right? We want to help coaches continue to improve, and we want to be aware of what our, what our coaches are doing um, because we can't be there every single day. We're drinking through a fire hose in our administrative role. So, um, so I think it's important, again, that you know, we set expectations, we provide tools and training and resources uh, to help them actually meet those expectations, and then we evaluate them. Um, so that we know they're effectively doing what we've asked them to do. And don't start your organizational mission with, um, I think it's. The, <laughs> Please, okay, not start okay your just, <laughs> just making sure I heard that message. <laughs> and ice cream must be in it, okay. Yes, so we learned that as well. Hot fudge as well. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you want to make it really happy. So, for all of the panelists, this is kind of a two parter. How does your organization work with the media to educate them about the important role that officials play in sports? If you're not currently working with them, what is the message you would really like them to know as we address the officiating crisis? So as we've talked about ad nauseum, you know, the, the media is obviously one of the hardest entities to persuade for our cause. Um, I, we, I think we heard it yesterday how media members are rarely people who have any experience in officiating. You know, I, I don't know if any of them have taken a class, if any of them have, you know, suited up and called balls and strikes and, and whatnot. Um, I don't know if they've experienced what us officials have become. I don't know if they've had, you know, I've had to terminate games and call the police before. I don't know if they've had, ever had to do that. Um, at new cells, you know, conflict increases ratings and, and the dollar controls all. So at OSIC, we have, we have two main avenues for this. The first is a very, uh, gentle and vulnerable one, and that's where I, you know, if I see something, I'm going to write a letter, and it, which sounds a little lame, but you know, Bill, you, you said it in that if you don't tell the story, someone else will, you know, and 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 I, you know, I'm I'm I don't like a lot of confrontation, which is you know a little ironic for you know an umpire sometimes, but uh, we we you know it's it's weird for me sometimes to do that, but um, it has to be done, you know. Um, and, and, and that fight has to be taken up. You know, it, 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 it pains me to hear that story about Wisconsin because, you know, I, you know, again, to be, to be completely honest and vulnerable, yeah, I may fall on that side of the, the, the small government, and yet at the same time, I'm like, this, this needs to be addressed. This is not, uh, you know, this is not negotiable, you know? Um, in some of those letters, I've written to 
like the MLB Network, or um, you know, I'm from New Jersey, so uh, I'm a Yankees fan, so I've written to the Yes Network. Um, you know, I, I remember during the pandemic watching a Yankees game where Paul O'Neill, who's a great you know Yankees icon, basically was 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 lambasting Angel Hernandez, who if you if you know who Angel is, he's a, he's an umpire and controversy fall, fall, finds him, unfortunately. And I've talked with so many major league umpires who are just like, we don't get it. He's the nicest guy in the world. Yes, when he started, he had a little bit of a temper, but we all adapt, we all evolve, we all get better. And do we not have that opportunity to do that? And I remember, you know, Paul O'Neill saying, like, you know, he does, he's a disgrace to the game, he doesn't know what he's talking, doing this, is, this is horrible, blah, blah. And Yankee fans watching this game are eating this up because it's Paul O'Neill saying it. And I, I, I literally had to change the channel and I, you know, during the pandemic. I'm like, oh, God is watching baseball here, you know? So, so, so I developed a drinking problem and, you know, um, you know now on, on the flip side, on like MLB Network, I'm watching, you know, I'll watch something and they'll, they'll bring up an issue with an umpire and they'll use, use the term ump show, hashtag ump show. And I got offended by that. I almost, I, 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 and, I, and, and you know, when I was listening to Gene talking about talking to a psychologist, and I'm like, yeah, I, we might go to the same one. Um, you know, I felt, um, I, I could almost empathize with, 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 with what some people have experienced with some of the horrible prejudice in this country. Um, because we're all wearing the stripes, we're all wearing, you know, all, all dressed up, we all look the same as officials, other than the, the differences in our uniforms. And yet, because we're dressed this way, you're going to, you know, we, we appear this way, you're going to treat us terribly? Like, that's, that's not okay, you know? Um, the, other, the other way that we do this with the media is we've created our own media outlets, you know? We, we have done things like, and this is a horrible self-promotion plug, but, you know, we published a book called On Sportsmanship. It's available now on Amazon, in hardcover, paperback, and Kindle, and whatnot. And yes, I wrote it because I had a lot of time on my hands. And, it, you know, we, we, it got a foreword by Dale Scott, retired MLB umpire. Dale told me a story once, and this, this again, goes back to um, what Ryan was saying about the coaches and whatnot. Do you know how many arguments between umpires and coaches and managers on the major league field are actually real? Maybe 5%? 95% of them are there for show. And, and, and Dale told me, he goes, he, he very early in his career developed this tactic where he would cover his mouth because he was laughing at what these coaches and managers were saying. And the first thing he would say to them is, is this a real concern or are you out here just you know, protecting your player and, and mimicking and whatnot? And most of the time it says, you know, we're just, we're just protecting our players. And, and, and it's, when you're in the stands, when you're, when you're at home watching on TV, you think that there's just real animosity. Meanwhile, these guys are going out for drinks afterwards together, you know? Dale told me the story around, around the turn of the century. He was in Anaheim when Terry Collins was managing the Angels. And, and Dale was at second, and he, he, had a, he had a whacker, and he, he made a call that went against the Angels. And Terry comes out to argue, and they're arguing in, 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 in short center field. And, and Terry's going, you know, he's gesticulating and getting crazy and whatnot. And but what Terry's saying is, Dale, I know you made that call, right? I know you got it, you nailed it, but I gotta be out here doing this stuff in order to get a reaction. You know? And the crowd's going wild and whatnot. And they start going, Dale, you gotta throw me out of this game. And Dale's like, I'm not throwing you out of this game, Terry. I gotta do paperwork if I do that, okay? I'm not, we're, not, we're not going through this. Finally, Terry crosses a line and Dale's like, all right, he has no choice, he's gotta toss him. And Terry looks right at him and he goes, Dale, I feel real sorry for you because I get to go back to my office right now where it's air conditioned and enjoy a bottle of wine and you got to stay out here and watch this shit. <laughs> okay? So, so we, so we, we try and, and, and do these things with, with, you know, these, these alternative media things. So we have the book, which we feel is a, is a fantastic resource. It's, uh, it's divided into three sections where first we talk about all these roles of the player, the coach, the fan, the parent, the official, the media. We have a middle section that's kind of some of the deeper dives on things like running up the scores, uh, fan psychology, stuff like that. And then the final part, as officials, they're case plays. They're about 30-some case plays where we give you a scenario and you have to figure out what the answer is, whether it's an open-ended thing or it's a multiple choice thing. And it's all over sports. So you, you'll have a baseball example, a football example. You'll have an example of people playing cards at home or, or teeing off and talking about a college football game, 
okay? We have a blog called The Strike Zone. We have a podcast called How You Play the Game. We, we try and be the, the media entities that we want to see because the, the message to the media is simple. As I said, you have so much power, perhaps more than you know, perhaps you know exactly what you're doing with it. Regardless of the topic, we, you, know, you, you control that narrative and you have the opportunity to educate the public on officiating rather than demonizing them. At NASO, uh, it's been an evolution of the media area. Uh, for years, we didn't get contacted a whole lot by the media about much of anything. Now, three to five times a week, media calling for commentary. Usually Barry handles those, but they, um, they're wanting to talk about officiating in some manner more than ever before. We have to find a way to turn this into a good thing. Usually when they're calling, it's not about a good thing. But the first thing we have to do is try to educate them when they're interviewing us about the words that are being used, even with inefficiency. Heard it here a few times. It just—it's one of those buzz things. We have to stop talking about the bad calls. It's an incorrect call. You know, we have to talk about judgment. We have to use the proper terms. Just like when we're teaching officials, when we're talking to coaches, use proper rule book language. It's really no different here. They want to use the buzzwords. You blew the call. It was a terrible call. We can't—we can't get into that. You got to—you got to guide them in a way and educate them in a way to use the proper terminology. In my mind, it's a small thing, but it takes the temperature down a little bit and frames the conversation a little differently. Everybody wants to talk about the bad call. Um, take the temperature down, use precise language. It can help a little bit. We have, in some measure, not entirely, but in some measure, given up on the education of professional and major college level announcers. Um, you can fight that battle every single day on every single network and every single game. When it's super egregious, uh, and it leads to uh, incredible national stories, NASO is weighing in, and of course doing its job in that way, in the public relations way. But where we are really trying to focus our efforts is at those grassroots level. Those local newspapers doing stories on officiating and getting them to see the bigger picture, and hopefully that has a greater impact on the greater good. And I'll tell you why we changed our thinking on this a little bit. And again, it's not that we ignore it. It's just that it's not a goal of ours to try to get the national media to, to talk better about us. It's never going to happen, frankly. But, anecdotal story, um, one of the pro leagues, in this case it's the NBA, they all do this now, but they were one of the, at the forefront of really trying to educate the media. They had weekly videos that they would send to the media, and, and they saw when they first started this that they could track it, nobody was watching it. They sent it to all the networks and all the big stars, all the big media stars, and, Nobody was watching. They were getting frustrated. They were trying to educate them on the rules. They're still doing that to this day. The fight continues. But we were in a meeting one time when this conversation was happening. One of the big superstar announcers in the country said, I don't care. It's not my job to learn the rules. It's not my job to know what you do. It's my job to be bombastic and out there and edgy. I don't care. Well, you were wrong last night. You, 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 you were flat out wrong about the rule. I don't care. And I, I think most of them fall into that category. There are exceptions. There are some great announcers out there. We have Mike Green, NBA guy, former official. He gets it. He carefully uses the right words when he's talking about an incorrect call. You can tell. He's working at it. He's trying to set a tone. They're few and far between, unfortunately. Very few announcers at that level have an officiating background. They all have a coaching or playing background. Um, so where, where we're working really hard, and I, I picked up on what Roger said before, this is important. We're also working really hard with local officials associations to have a public relations plan and try to actually develop somebody who have, hopefully has some background in communications, has a, have a spokesperson. Because something's going to happen at the local level you need to respond to. We just had it happen. I uh, got a call from a longtime NASO member in Iowa. We have a, a high profile case that happened the second time this year, actually, where a racial accusation was made with an official. The official denies it. Um, the, 
the local association has something to do, right? What are they going to do on behalf of their member, their, their dues-paying member? Are you, gonna, are you gonna fight the good fight? But how do you go about that? Uh, how do you do an investigation? How do you participate in investigating? What if it's true? What if it actually was uttered? You know, you have to be prepared for crisis management at the local association level. This is something we never thought about years ago. But what are you going to say? The media is calling the local officials association for comment. The coach said, the, your referee said this. What do you have to say about that? Most local officials associations are not equipped to deal with that. And either they ignore it, which is bad, or the media is coming in with an agenda already, which is bad. How do you carefully craft a statement, put it out there, and yet be supportive of the education environment, the investigation that's about to happen? So. It's a very difficult thing. Uh, again, local associations, right, all volunteers meeting every other Wednesday night to talk about rules and mechanics, and we're dealing with stuff like this. But those that have gotten this buttoned up with a crisis management plan, maybe develop somebody to be a spokesperson, contact NASO, we reviewed the statement that they put out, we helped them craft it, frankly. Um, it, it, it's helping, at least in a crisis management situation, that we have we have a say in this. We're not going to just hide because they're not letting us hide and we shouldn't be hiding. We've got to have a really strong conversation and educate our local officials association. In our case, it's through our association advantage program through NASO to help them think like this as a professional organization. Even though it's a bunch of volunteers, you've got to have a crisis management plan because it's going to happen if it hasn't happened to you yet. <coughs> So I, I agree with Bill 100%. Um, you'll recall in the beginning when I was talking about, you know, make sure you're telling your story. Um, you know, the other thing I would tell you is that don't let a crisis be a missed opportunity. And I tell clients this all the time. What I mean by that is, yes, you may have a flashpoint, and Bill's exactly right. Something's going to happen in one of your states. There's going to be video, and it's unfortunately going to be bad for for the individual and it'll be on national tv and the today show and everyone else will parachute in and and do their two days worth of coverage on it but there's opportunity there and that using that unfortunate event for the greater good and so what i think you know when i i'm not currently working on this particular issue but if i were to be working on this issue I would encourage you all to not look at it in silos. So don't have your comms people over here. You know, don't have Bill and his folks over here looking at state legislation. There's, there's a, a marriage there, and this is what I do with clients all the time. You know, at the federal level, I do a lot of work at the federal level, and we don't just go into a lawmaker and say, hey, here's the law, this is what needs to be done. Um, it'd be nice if that's how it worked, but a lot of times what we have to do is we have to build coalitions, right? We have to build support for something. And so this is where I think if you all go back to your states and you work with your comms people and your organizations, I believe, and, and this is just me as a former news person, News people want good stories, okay? It's like anything in life, there's good and bad and everything, right? There's, there are 3% of journalists that probably aren't really good at what they do. Maybe it's more than 3% depending on who you are, but I'm giving a benefit of the doubt. The point is the majority of people, they just want to tell good stories, okay? And I remember Jim, you know, Jim Rome used to have a sports radio show for years, um, was asked about this, and he said, I don't want to use, Jim, people listen to your show all the time, and it's not just because you have Michael Jordan and the big people on there. You've had like, you know, the, the high school coaches and the little league coaches, well, you know, why, how, do you, how do you make your show so interesting no matter who it is? And his response, and I use this line all the time with clients, is he said, it's real simple. He says, I just make sure my guests have a take and don't suck. And, and so how I translate that with clients, clients is that, okay, if you're gonna be out there and trying to get the media to do something, to cover your story, have a take, right? And then also make it easy for them. So for you all, to, to me, I think this is a type of story, and what I'm focused on specifically is the challenges face, facing officials and why there's a shortage of refs, right? I think this is something that you all can go back to your states, find, you know, find that character, and I mean character in a good way, not in a bad way. Find that ref, okay, that's very personable and outgoing. You know, you've got that person, you've got someone from your state organization. I mean, I could package this up in a formula for you to go to your media outlets, and they will cover this story. And the more states 
that get the local coverage it needs to grow organically okay this isn't we're not we're not firing a rifle shot to get the wall street journal to do a big story or the new york times yeah that's great but at the end of the day what what i think is more beneficial to you all is having 200 to 300 stories in communities all over the country talking about this issue that creates the groundswell of support you may or may not know this in every state legislature and i work in the majority of them and certainly in washington it doesn't matter if you're a democrat a republican or an independent they all have staff that are looking at media all the time, no matter what caucus you're in. And they do what are called clips, as you all, I'm sure, are familiar with. And so they look for issues. So if you've got 300 of these stories, that's going to start percolating. And if you're a congressman or a congresswoman in Washington, and you're somebody in your staff's like, they're always looking for stories and things to try to be out front of. I agree they react to a lot of things, but they do like to, on occasion to stumble into being proactive. Um, and this is the kind of thing if they're like, hey, we need to do something about this. And obviously if you can find someone, I agree with Bill, if you can find someone in your state legislature that's played sports, was an athlete, you know, that's, that you're, you're, you're much better off than finding someone that nothing against accountants or someone that didn't play sports, but that's a much harder sell. So go for the low hanging fruit. Um, and I think if you get that, that additional media attention out there, that'll help with that storytelling. And then hopefully in these states, you'll be able to, uh, to get some positive legislation. I think that's, that's critically important. I do agree though, that what's gonna happen eventually in some of these states, you know, you're starting to see an escalation of more and more of this video, and that's part of the society we live in now, right? It's, um, it's a quick little story. I, I, I do a lot of work with schools, and it's usually um, inappropriate relationships, teacher-student, or fights, videos, shootings, you know, all the things, unfortunately, that you hear about in schools. Um, but I was at a, you would think this wouldn't happen, at a school board meeting, okay? The only reason why I was there is because it was a very sensitive issue and it's going on, it's starting to spread across the country where it's the gender identity where the students are saying they want to associate as a he or a she, but they don't want their parents to know and so the school's once again caught in the middle. So we're in this particular meeting and it's, it's you know, packed, packed room and they're taking discussion, debate, and this elderly man, and I say elderly, he's probably in his 70s, he gets really emotional, and as he stands up, a gun falls out of his um, uh, belt, you know, he had it in his waistband. It falls on the ground, and I, I see it, everybody sees there's no police in this meeting or anything, and the thing that amazed me the most, before I even could react or anything, there were at least eight to 10 moms out with the camera phone recording the video that fast and i thought about that and just bringing it back to what you know when something will happen if you think about some of the things that you see on the news now it's like was somebody just sitting there with their i mean it's amazing how fast we are with these phones now and with video so what happens is just to play this out is the video gets captured it's sensational right it's it's you know there's violence there's screaming it's emotional it's all the things that make the news the new soup, right? It's all the, you know, the paprika, it's all jumbled up in there. And so they're gonna run the hell out of this video. And that creates the flashpoint. And that's why in a number of your states, you know, there's certain laws, it could be called Zachary's Law or Bobby's Law or whatever. And then fortunately, those kinds of things are going to happen. But when they do, you all need to be ready and not staring at a blank screen with the cursor blinking. You need to say, okay, we're ready for this because it's gonna happen. Here's what we need to do, and look for a way to, to turn that to the good, as, uh, as Bill was mentioning, because there is an opportunity in a crisis like that, because you've got the attention of the country or of your state, depending on what the issue is. How do you use that for, for good? And that's the challenge I would, I would leave for you all, is I'd figure that out when you go home. How do you take something bad like that and turn it into something positive? That's all great stuff. Um, Similar to Bill, Positive Coaching Alliance gets called every time anything, anytime there's abuse of an official, abuse of a coach, a parent, you know, coach altercation, we get calls all the time, and obviously that's very reactive, right? Um, and so, you know, we try to certainly bring kind of the proactive approach, the educational approach to everything that we do when we respond, but I think the second part of the question was if, if we could control the narrative, essentially, what would we try to do to control the narrative? And, I think it's, if we could have the media help us really 
broadcast the fact that youth and high school sports, the mission is completely different than pro sports, right? Pro high level colleges entertainment sports. It's when it all costs, it's a business. That's not what we have here, right? But that's the default mentality of everybody in our society because that's the way we consume sports, right? It's entertainment. So that mindset trickles into um, the youth and high school space, which is where we see a lot of this when it all costs culture, it's high expectation performance, all that type of stuff that, that naturally is a default mentality. So, um, so I think what I'd love to have is all those negative instances and everything, right? The call out culture when things happen is really, really good to raise awareness. But I wish the media would help us on calling people in. So awareness is great, right? But then if we continue to do that call out approach on our hyper local level with individuals and, and the relationships that we have, the wall goes up and good luck getting through. Right? Defensive mechanisms go on. Anytime we call people out, defensive mechanisms come up. Right? And now it doesn't matter what you say, you're wrong, regardless of whether you're 100% right or not. But if we can take the approach of calling people in, while all these public you know, situations are going on, while all these big campaigns are going on to raise awareness, on a hyper-local level, what can we do to call people in? Right? I think Eric from 360, in our breakout yesterday, said, um, uh, what was it, Eric? How do we, how do we share the, the good stories and how do we build people up, right, as opposed to just constantly calling them out? How do we tell the good stories, right? We need to do that on a hyper-local level. Listen, I need your help. I need your help. This is happening. We all know this is happening. If we're going to change this, I need your help. Coaches, parents, other leaders, I need your help, right? And then have a plan on how we can ask them to actually help. Right, not just say I need help and then that's a blank statement. Like here are the ways that you can actually help. If we could have the media really assist on promoting the ways that, that if we want to call people in and have them help out, um, I think that would be a, a massive win. Um, and we can do that more on a hyper local level than we can on the big national stage. Right? National stage again are the talking heads, they want the wow factor stories, all that type of things. But our local newspapers, our local <coughs> news stations, where we have some potential relationships. Um, that's where we can really try to leverage those relationships to call people in, as opposed to just continuing to call people out. So it's often stated that change has to occur with spectators and parents at the youth level so that the behavior doesn't continue at the high school level. How can all of our organizations, not just the ones on the stage, but in the room and anybody who has a, a stake in sports, how can we all work together to start changing the culture and educating parents within youth sports? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that real quick. And I think Ken, yesterday with, with Bill's session, I love that he used the 20-60-20, right? Where 20% of our officials are, are gone, right? 20% of our officials are amazing, are rock star human beings, and there's a 60% that are influential. I use that all the time when I talk to about parents, right? We got 20% of parents who are complete jerks, right? They're horrible human beings, and it doesn't matter what we do, we're not gonna influence them, right? They're just set in their ways. Right, then we've got the 20% of parents that clap for both teams that are, everything's sunshine and rainbows, my kid's just happy to be here, right? The, the great, loving parents. And then we've got the 60% in the middle that can be influenced, right? We really need to influence those that are, are in the middle. And I think it's important when we talk about culture change, when we talk about culture change, a lot of people think, hey, I need to change that person and their thought process. None of us in this room, nobody in society can change a person, right? Now we can influence them, we provide education and hopefully get them to a point where they make the decision themselves to change. But that's all we can do, is help to influence them so that they make the decision to change. We can change people. And then the other side of it, which we talked about obviously a lot over the last couple of days, is how do we make sure we're structured in the environment so that we can control when those people are out of line, right? And not just the zero tolerance keeps coming up, but again, the enforcement of that is the vital piece. Right, we have a lot of we work with a lot of coaches and, and a lot of programs where they mandate training. Right, they mandate training until the coaches don't show up, and then they just let them go. And then good luck next year trying to mandate training for anything because they're going to call your bluff. Right, so it's the same thing with parents in the stands and in youth, in youth organizations. If we say hey, zero tolerance, but then we let them get away with whatever they're doing anyways. Good luck trying to call anybody in. So I think the other side of it too is, is from the high school side, we need to partner with our youth organizations, 
right? Our coaches with their individual programs, a lot of times there's either parent run, youth sports organizations that are essentially the feeder programs to the school environment, right? When we're, especially public schools, the kids in our community are the kids that are gonna come to our school. So if we're not actively involved in supporting the youth sport environment, whether it's from organizational leaders, whether it's from the coaches directly, and being active and helping set expectations of what we want to see in the youth program to help feed the high school program, um, then we're missing an opportunity. So the more we can create those natural partnerships and, and use a lot of the tools and resources that you all have access to, to help support a lot of the parent-run youth sports organizations, right? When you're creating all these, all these plans to handle adversity, all these other, other issues, like those are happening. These are sports issues in general, not just high school sports issues. So if we can share a lot of those tools and resources with the youth sport organization leaders, it goes a really long way. I, I would say there's just there's an easy solution and an impossible implementation, which is playing time. You talk about the youth level and all that playing time. I think we've got to the point where your kid is not playing if the parent continues to act this way. I think it's gotten to that level. Now that was, I mean, that's blasphemy for. <laughs> I get it. I know how how difficult that would be to implement. How challenging it is to hurt a child in that way. But I think we've reached that level that if this continues on this path, your kid is not going to play, period. Very difficult. Uh, but I think we've gotten that. Uh, there's got to be a way to somehow temper expectations of our sports officials and our athletes and our coaches at these levels. I, I, believe it or not, I got invited to talk to a coaching group one time, and that was a lot of fun. Um, I said, this is a football coaching group, and I said to them, how many mistakes do you think the average NFL crew makes in a game? 25, 40, 40, I mean, really 40, come on. Uh, you might believe that, but the number is something around, hovering around 3.8. 3.8 mistakes in a game that are measurable. And most fans and people wouldn't even know what they are. Okay, We all know the, the high profile ones, but most of them don't know what they are. So take a step down. What is the average Big Ten crew? How many mistakes per game on average? Unless Jason's working, the number's about, uh, the, <laughs> the number's about five and a half to six. Mistakes per game, measurable mistakes per game, right? So what do we think is gonna happen at the high school level? Is, is 10 to 12 reasonable? And the coach is just, what do you mean? 10 to 12 mistakes? And yes, that is happening in every single one of your games and most of them you don't even know about, right? Now take it to the youth level. What do you think is going to happen? They're, they're going to make mistakes, and lots of them. We have to find a way to all deal with this. This old adage of when sports officiating has to start perfect and get better from there, the expectations are off the charts and ridiculous, frankly. And we have to have public relations efforts, coaches' education efforts, parent education efforts, all these efforts to just take it down a notch and understand that every single participant in this environment, especially at the youth level, they're gonna make a lot of mistakes today. And our officials are gonna be among them. Hopefully it's not game changing and game deciding and, and things that cause everybody to get upset. This is going to happen, deal with it. That's the message. If you watch the to, to kind of go off of this, if you watched the, the World Series this last year, you saw Pat Hoberg, who I think had to play in game two, call a 100% game balls and strikes. That's never been done before. That's, he was a young kid from Iowa in his early 30s, great ball strike umpire. And people were like, you mean that's not the norm? <laughs> I was talking on, my, on a recent podcast with my friend Chris Conroy who worked the 2021 World Series and I said, 
you know, you had a pretty good plate score this year, and he's like, you jumped me, I was like, 97 point, what, I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah, you did, okay, 97 point, yeah. And, you, and they still want the automated ball strike system, where the computer still can't even sniff 90% accuracy, and the humans are doing better than that, okay? And to, and to kind of go off of what Ryan said, when we, when we have to, we say we have to empower our allies, it's so impossible to change people. We talk about this in, in just general psychology, you know, you can't change other people, you can only change yourself. And we pray that the indirect work that we do influences people to, to, to make change. If, you, if, if just maybe if a parent who is a quote unquote problem sees most <coughs> of the parents acting appropriately, you, you just hope that Maybe they say I should align with that. Maybe it's it's a shot in the dark sometimes, you know. Um, one of the things that I think that I see from my experience is is in the, the 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 question that was asked, we have to align ourselves as 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 entities and pool our our resources collectively. Um, OSIP's biggest problem is funding. We can't get. And we're 501c3, and, and we're, but we're swimming upstream. You, 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 we apply for a grant and people look at us like, why is this a problem? And we can't do this, we can't do our work without that, you know? I'm, I'm, I, host, I host about eight trivia nights at local restaurants and pubs and whatnot for OSA as a way of saying, this is your opportunity at your local watering hole to practice good sportsmanship and to realize you're here playing free trivia of your own volition. No one is making you be here. So if you're gonna boo one of my questions or complain, like, you have a bar tab, just pay it and go, okay? It's not rocket science. No one is making you be here. Absolutely nobody. Um, so, so, so what, you know, so we, and we have fee-for-service opportunities to try and make that money and still it goes nowhere. Book sales, down. We had to table one of our ideas. We had, we had a program called Work With Me, which was a clinic program where the pilot would be with, the pilot part of it was with me. I, would, I, I made myself available to baseball leagues, teams, high school, youth, whatever. And I said, what I want to do is, I, you know, for a small fee, I will come in and work with your team, your coaches, your parents, and say, let me tell you what I'm looking at so that you know why I'm making the calls that I'm making. It's as simple as saying to, their, to these young catchers, receive a pitch and don't move the mitt. You move the mitt, you're telling me it was outside the strike zone and I'm gonna call it a ball if it's a close pitch. Not a bite. Not one team, not one league said, we want this. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle. So we, the people in this room, need to work together to get that out there. Because there are people, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I started this, because I didn't see, you know, I could not find, you know, an encompassing group that did this. And when we do that, one, you know, when we pool our resources, that's how we end up together. The only reason I'm here is because someone on Twitter that I follow retweeted something that Dana put up. And then I retweeted it. And then I have a message from Dana, who I'd never known before. You want to come to this thing in Indianapolis? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. I, I got to get out of New Jersey. The smell is terrible. <laughs> it's, it's really bad. So, I, I, on behalf of the entire state, I apologize. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, I mean, we, if, if, you, don't have to re, you don't have to be retweeting everything. But when I see something on Twitter that has hashtag bench <coughs> bad behavior, oh, I'm retweeting that, okay? On, on all of it, and social media can be the, one of the greatest tools, and yet it can be the devil. And and and, and I, I just you know talk about my drinking problem for crying out loud. You, know, you go on and you're just like, oh my god, I can't believe this stuff. But you got to go on there to further your mission. You know, my day job is as a professional jazz musician, and I'm like, I don't want to be on here. But in order to, I got to get people to come out to the gig so I can pay bills. You know, it's stuff. I know we're about to run out of time, but just two quick things I would just say to how to, how to work with local organizations. I, I think you, how you would be best, um, best served is if you go back to your states 
and you create a sense of urgency, okay? And how you do that is twofold. Number one, you need to put a face on the officials, okay? It's not just black and white stripes, okay? This, these are moms and dads, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, and find, find someone, I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier, media, they like good characters, right? If you, th if you watch any human interest story, right, you connect with that person. It doesn't matter whether it's sports, whether it's someone that's um, helped someone that's in need, the media likes good characters, good actors, and that you need to find that person in your community and find a couple, you know, in different parts of the state. People that are outspoken, great personality, that are refs, that can help put the face on that story. That'll help number one. And then the second thing is, and based on what I'm hearing from people much smarter than me on this issue, we are getting very close to the flashpoint, right? Whether it's something bad happening in a state or we don't have enough officials, meaning we're gonna to have to change our games, right? So instead of playing on Tuesday nights at seven, we're gonna play four games, back-to-back -back double headers on Saturday between nine and whatever that is, or worse yet, we're not playing. There's not gonna be girls volleyball or whatever, pick the sport. So you, you need to start talking about that right now because that will get the attention. That's another thing that'll get the attention of the media. It's like, whoa, what's going on? I mean, we've all grown up with sports for years. Why, why is this happening? So those would be the two things that I think I would encourage you all to think about back in your states. All right, well, I, we, I did have a couple of other scripted questions, but we've had such good conversations that we're out of time. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your contributions and your, there's just great resources sitting on the stage with me right now. Please feel free to reach out to any of these gentlemen. Um, I was asked by a couple of attendees if it would be okay if I sent out a distribution list of everybody who's here with email addresses. I plan to do that. If you do not want your email address shared, please let me know or else, I'll, or else it's going to be on there. So if we could give one more round of applause for our uh, wonderful panel.